Welcome to the Audacity to Podcast, episode 143, how to back up your podcast, WordPress website, and more. Thank you for joining me for the Audacity to Podcast. I'm Daniel J. Lewis, and this is the award-winning how-to podcast about podcasting and using Audacity. It's where I give you the guts and teach you the tools to podcast with passion, organization, and dialogue. Backups are really important to people because if you ever have something go wrong, then you know, if you've ever had something go wrong, you know how important a backup is, and you won't really know how important it is until you have something go wrong and you desperately need your backups in order to save a file that's corrupted. Maybe something was lost. Maybe you just need to find something old and you can't find it because you may have deleted it thinking you no longer would need it. There are many different ways to back things up and I'm going to share with you five different methods of backing up with several different tools that you can use for each method. Now you can use all of these methods together or you could pick which one seems to work best for your workflow. But I recommend recording backups, revision backups, computer backups, WordPress website backups, and a long-term archive backup. So let's jump into these five things. But before I do, I've got some cool announcements at the end about the iTunes affiliate program change, something cool that Stitcher did, New Media Expo, and the Podcast Awards. So if those interest you, definitely stick around for the announcements at the end. But let's get it in get into this. Number one, recording backups. Regardless of how you're recording your podcast, there is always that ever so slight chance that something could go wrong. Depending on how you are recording your podcast, this chance may be greater than other ways. For example, if you're recording into a computer, something is more likely to go wrong than if you're recording into an external recorder. Now that chance is still very low, But it is possible, and it is more possible recording into a computer than an external recorder. And I've talked about external recorders before, and I'll mention them more in just a moment. But these types of situations can be very easily unforeseen. It could be your computer crashes spontaneously, or the power goes out. I was recording our Clean Comedy podcast just this last week, and there was some kind of construction going on outside. And in the middle of our podcast the power went out. That had never happened in the middle of a podcast before. So naturally, our microphones turned off, the mixer turned off, the live stream turned off, the webcam turned off. Everything was turned off except for my external recorder, which had batteries in it as well. And thankfully, they were charged. I'm thankful they were charged because we didn't lose that recording. I was able to then just, I I marked that spot with the recorder and saved that recording that we had so far. And then once the power came back on, I was able to resume the recording. If we lost the power and I was using a desktop computer that has no battery backup and I was recording into the computer, it could be possible that I would lose my recording completely if I was recording that way. But that kind of thing doesn't really happen, but it's great to have some kind of backup for your recording. So I've got a few different ways that you can have a recording backup, some type of secondary system that's recording your podcast audio or maybe even your video. You could live stream your podcast. There, I've done a whole series about live streaming and you can get the link to that in the show notes at theaudacitypodcast.com slash 143. But when you live stream to many different services, they often record your live stream And depending on the level of your account with those services, you may be able to download that recording later. For example, if you are using Google Hangouts on Air to record your podcast, they are recording that straight onto YouTube. If you're using YouTube Live, they're recording that onto YouTube. If you use Livestream or Ustream, they both have options that you can record your episode. If you use the Flash Media Live Encoder or Wirecast to record your live stream and stream that out to different services, that often has the ability that you can record to a file on your computer. And 
services also like Mixler do record your file, but then you have to be a premium member in order to download that recorded file. But many of these services then allow you to record it while you're live streaming it. So if something goes wrong, that could be your backup right there. That's a cool little advantage to live streaming. And I've had to take advantage of this before because I use an external recorder. There have been a couple times where I paused the recording and I forgot to resume it when we were ready to go again. So we might have been talking for 10 or 15 minutes and my recorder was not recording, but we were live streaming. We live stream most of our podcasts on Noodle Mix Network, certainly the ones that I host, the Audacity Podcast on Mondays at 2 p.m., the Ramen Noodle Clean Comedy Podcast on Wednesdays at 6 p.m., and once, Once Upon a Time podcast at its new time, 8 p.m. And also we have our Under the Dome podcast. If you hear this in time, there will be a finale episode of Under the Dome radio podcast streamed live at on September 18th at, that's a Wednesday night, at 10 p.m. And all of those times are in Eastern time, which depending on daylight savings time and such, it, it might be different for you. But those moments that I've had, I forgot to resume the recording and then was able to go to the live stream for sure a slightly lower quality recording for 10 or 15 minutes. But it worked. It saved my bacon. And I was so happy because whenever you have your bacon saved, it's a good thing. Bacon is good. Having it saved even better. So live streaming can be a recording backup option for you. Also look at a double ender, or you could call it a triple ender, quadruple ender, whatever, multi-ender. This is where you're recording your side of the conversation, is, and someone is recording their side of the conversation. And this will allow you to not only get a much higher quality in your audio, and I've done this with several guests where I've recorded their side on my own end but they've also recorded their side of the conversation. I referred to their side, and you can look at episode 29 of the Audacity podcast for more information about double enders. But this also works as a great backup. And I used this when Cynthia Sanchez and I did the episode number 136 about Pinterest for podcasting. Cynthia has an odd internet connection. It it would be great at first and then really deteriorate badly. And to the point that she was talking about something. It was so good. I didn't want to interrupt her and have to ask her to repeat it because that just wouldn't have worked well for the flow. But I did have her recording her side of the conversation ahead of time. So that made for a great backup that I used that actually instead of my own recording. And the episode audio quality was so much better. I did the same thing with Mike and Isabella Russell in our recent episode about podcast promos, but we didn't have any problems with our bandwidth there. But it was still great to have that backup and something that was much higher quality than what I had. So a double ender is a great recording backup. You could also look at a software recorder. This could be a redundant software recorder. So maybe you're recording into Audacity and some other program like a Skype recorder. Or maybe you're recording into an external recorder and into a software recorder like a Skype recorder or Audacity or some other program. Redundant recordings are great because if one fails, then you've got the other. And also, of course, an external recorder makes a great backup for whatever way that you're recording. Even if you're just using your iPhone as a backup recorder, but you're using your computer as the primary recording device, your iPhone can make a great backup system, whether you're using the built-in mic or maybe you plug in something into the iPhone through your mixer so that you can use its recording app or whatever in order to record. That can be a great backup for you as well. So recording backups are super helpful for if anything ever goes wrong during your recording. So now you have your episode recorded and you start editing it. You'll start to run into multiple versions of your projects or a revision history of all the things that you change throughout your project and ways that you change your audio, you process things, you edit things, you clip things, whatever kind of changes you're making. It's sometimes very helpful to have backups of those different versions. So if you need to go back to an older version in order to fix something, or maybe you applied a filter the wrong way, then you can go back to an old version and get the unedited version that you can then 
work from and you get a much higher quality recording. I once put out an episode where I used, it was early on, I think, when I was using Chris's dynamic compressor and the in-studio co-host sounded great. The Skype co-host sounded terrible because the end of their words were being cut off all the time and I didn't realize it until after I already put the episode out and people started emailing me, letting me know of the problem. So I went back to my original recording reprocessed the audio and then put that out that's because i had different versions backed up and for me i keep just the original raw recording and then the final unless i am making a whole lot of changes and edits that's the process i follow just the original and the final and the original is actually instead of the stereo recording it's down to a mono recording so a few ways that you can keep these kinds of backups are a uh, just a two-step process of duplicating whatever you're working on and compress it. So if you have a project folder, duplicate that folder and then compress it down into an archive. And Windows and OS X now, I think even Linux, allow you to just right-click on a collection of files or folders or a single folder and compress it. So you could duplicate it, compress it, and then label it in some way so you know what version this is. You could say raw or unedited or version one or whatever you want to do that is obvious to you. And then that's an easy way that you have a version history of your podcast. So if you need to go back to one of your early revisions, you can. What's also easy with this is if you're on a Mac computer, Apple Time Capsule is great for this because the Apple Time Capsule will back up your computer either once a day or can back up quite consistently throughout the day and it keeps versions of your file so you can go back in the history of a particular project and get that older version. However, depending on how you have the schedule set up for Time Capsule, this may not be that helpful. If you want to go back in your revision history to an hour ago that may not exist on time capsule and if you're on anything other than a mac then time capsule won't help you very well time capsule just to clarify is a network router and a local uh, network storage so it has a built-in hard drive you can get them now in multiple terabytes and it is also a network device, so you can access that storage over the network. It works great even if you're not on a Mac. It works great just so you have network storage. But if you're on Mac, you have Time Machine, which backs up very nicely to the Apple Time Capsule. And I have affiliate links to this in the show notes if you want to check it out. I definitely recommend it if you're on a Mac. I use it, and it's great. I love it here at my home. Then the third option for keeping revision backups are... Uh, is Dropbox. Dropbox is an online cloud storage and sharing service, but it works great for keeping versions of files. As soon as you save a file that's in your Dropbox folder, it uploads to the internet and it will keep the versions, past versions of that file or of that folder. So you can easily go back. I've done this several times when I realized I overwrote a project that I wanted to save my old versions of something and I overwrote it. So I went back to Dropbox and I was able to get the old version. I have all of my clients' projects inside of Dropbox and I've got a lot of space now in Dropbox. If you want to sign up and you haven't, you can get it for free with a couple gigabytes that you can use for free at theaudacitypodcast.com slash Dropbox. That's D-R-O-P-B-O-X. But having those versions that I can go back to is priceless if you ever change something. Now, do keep in mind that this does have to upload. So if you're on limited bandwidth or if you have really big project files, then you might run into problems where the older version can't load quick enough for your new version to be saved and your old version saved as well. So those are a few options for keeping revision backups or version backups. Number three, computer backup computers crash, hard drives fail, people make mistakes. That's why I think that a regular backup of your computer can really be priceless. And there are many different ways to back up your computer. An easy way is an external hard drive. It's extremely versatile and you can get now multiple terabyte hard drives for around $100. And you can copy files and folders to it manually 
or you can use some kind of synchronization or backup program on your computer. And this can work then on any kind of computer and you have your backups on that external hard drive. And depending on the program you're using, it may save versions, it may um, archive full projects for you, but this will be a way that you can go back in your history and get backups of your computer, including some programs like Super Duper is a popular program out there that can back up an entire archive of your computer so that if your computer crashes terribly, then you have that backup that you can go to and restore even your programs and your files as well. If you're on a Mac, Apple Time Capsule works great for this because Time Machine does very much the same thing, that it backs up your entire computer, programs and all, so that you have that complete backup. But that is for Mac only with Time Machine. But the third option that I use and recommend for regular backups is Backblaze because both your external hard drive and even an Apple Time Capsule are local backups. So if you have a fire in your house or a tornado or a nuclear bomb goes off in your house, then you lose your backup because your backup was sitting right next to your computer. Sometimes when people steal a computer, they might steal the hard drive that's sitting right next to it as well. So your backups could be gone even though you've been keeping backups. That's why I love Backblaze. Backblaze is unlimited backup to the internet and it's super simple the approach that backblaze takes is just back up everything except for certain things like program files system files certain things like that which you should hopefully have a different way of backing those up otherwise but it will back up things without your having to think about it i've used other tools like mosey and carbonite before mosey is no longer unlimited Carbonite will slow down your bandwidth if you get above a certain size of your backup, and they have some other issues that I don't like. But Backblaze, I've been very happy with. They're fast, they are super easy, and really inexpensive too. It's three, well, four to five dollars per month to back up your computer with unlimited storage, and you can restore your files from anywhere, and your files are safe, and you can't even back up an attached external hard drive to Backblaze. As long as you plug that hard drive in about every 30 days or fewer, then it can back up that hard drive. And it does keep a little bit of a version history for you as well on the internet. So I love Backblaze and I have an affiliate relationship with them that if you sign up, then I do get a portion of that back. You can check them out at theaudacitypodcast.com slash Backblaze or in the show notes for this episode. That's number 143. So that's backing up your computer. We've covered recording backups, revision backups, and computer backups. Now, your WordPress website backup. There are so many things that could go wrong with a WordPress website because it's not totally under your control. Your site could be hacked. That's not very likely, especially if you keep everything updated and don't use bad plugins and don't use terrible, weak passwords. But your WordPress website or any kind of website could be hacked You could be suspended for some reason. Maybe you're hosting your media on your web host. (laughs) Certain updates can sometimes break things. There could be also the problem between keyboard and uh, chair where you make some kind of problem and you break something on your site. You don't know how to fix it. That's where having daily backups of your website and also snapshots before you make any kind of major changes can really help you so that if anything goes wrong, you have something fairly recent to roll back to and you can avoid the crisis. You can avoid having your website down. You can avoid all of this stuff, maybe even not lose your content at all, but have that backup there. There are a few different ways that you can backup your websites, and it depends on what kind of software you have running your website, like whether it's WordPress, Drupal, or Joomla, but most of you out there are using WordPress, and that's the uh, site, or the system I recommend for running websites. WordPress is so easy. I've talked about that before, but your web host may provide a backup on their own, and that would be backing up all of your files, backing up your databases, backing up your email addresses, all of that. They may do that for you, 
but you need to find out what do they back up, how easy is it to retrieve the backup, and how often do they back up, and how many backups do they keep. Some companies will only keep backups for a few days. Some will keep backups for a month. Some may not back up your database, but they'll back up your files. So you need to find out from them what they do and how easy it is to get those backups and where those backups are stored. Bluehost and HostGator provide backup for your website. It's part of your account with them. But certain other places may charge extra for regular backups. So that would be like the website level backup. Your your all of your databases, all of your files, all of your email addresses, everything related to your web hosting account could be backed up by a service like that. And there are other very technical third-party services that you could get involved with. But if you're running a WordPress website, backup is a lot easier because everything is tied into WordPress in some way. And there are many free backup plugins for WordPress. And I'll have a link to these in the show notes at theaudacitypodcast.com slash 143. You could look at something like BackWP Up or Backup to Dropbox or Backup to Cloud or all kinds of things. If you just search your WordPress plugins archive for installing a new plugin, just search for backup. You will find a lot of backups, a lot of backup tools that can back up to Dropbox, it can email you the file, it can back up just the database, it can back up the database and all your files or just your files, just your uploads, just your settings, whatever. It can do all kinds of things. It could be on a schedule, it could be on demand. Many different plugins doing many different things and many of them are free or have certain free options and they can be great for that. But the plugin I recommend if you have a WordPress website is Backup Buddy. I really think that Backup Buddy is the easiest WordPress backup I've seen. You can have so many options of how you back things up and what you do with those backups. You can schedule regular backups. Like what I do is I have a weekly complete backup of my entire site. That's all of my files, all of my folders, all of that's all of my images, media, everything there about WordPress and my database. That's a complete backup every week and it keeps about a month worth of backups of those weekly backups and I can adjust that to whatever I want it to be but I also have daily backups that are backing up just my database because my database is much smaller than everything else and the database changes much more frequently because whenever I post something new on my site or I get a comment or someone posts something in the forums that's a database change and so those would be backed up by a database backup. And having that daily or even maybe multiple times in a day is extremely helpful. And Backup Buddy can back up to Amazon S3, Dropbox. It can create a file for me to download. It can email me whenever a backup has been made. All of these things. And Backup Buddy is also extremely useful for migrating your website from one place to another. It's super easy. Pack up the entire thing, move it over. You don't even have to install WordPress on your new server. You can just restore everything from the Backup Buddy archive. It works great. They don't claim to be extremely compatible with multi-site, and I have seen some issues with WordPress multi-site, but it still works, and it's still reliable, and I've still used it for WordPress multi-site backups many times and for restores many times and haven't had a problem and i have an affiliate link with them which you can check out at the audacity to podcast.com slash backup buddy and that link will also be in the show notes for episode 143 and i do highly recommend this plugin yeah you can get free plugins to do similar things but backup buddy it does it so beautifully and is updated very very often to I highly recommend it and they have different levels of service that you can get depending on how many websites that you need to back up but I do really like it it makes backup so much easier you don't have to be a geek to back up your website so when you have your recording backups your revision backups your computer backups and your WordPress website backups you've published your episode out there you're completely finished with your episode your media All of that kind of editing and everything, you're finished. It's done. People are downloading it and enjoying it. Now what do you do with the original files? 
I see a lot of people ask questions about this, and some people will only keep their actual published files. That would be the MP3 or the video or whatever format their final published episode is in. That's all they would keep, and they would delete everything else. I do not recommend that because that means that if you ever need to fix anything, you have nothing to go back to except for the same thing that everyone else can hear. So it's very difficult to fix things. It's very difficult to get excerpts. Maybe you want to reuse something in a previous, from a previous episode in a future episode, all kinds of reasons why you'd want to save your original recordings. And I do recommend keep an archive, a long-term archive of all of your master files. These are all of the things like your different versions, maybe every file that's associated with an episode, your video clips, your images, your show notes, your sound effects, your bumpers that you used, anything that was unique to that episode, lump it all in one folder together and archive that somewhere. There are three different ways that I recommend that you could do this. And in all of these three different ways, an easy way, an easier way to maintain your backups would be put all of your files related to that particular episode or project into a single folder. And then compress that folder into something like a zip file and then it's not only smaller but it's also a lot easier to maintain and organize and then you can label it whatever you want without changing your folder structure so that way you have one file instead of thousands of files to move around and maintain and versions and all of that so three different ways that you could do this I've been for a while backing up to DVD-Rs. These are writable DVDs, and most computers these days can write to a DVD-R disc. This is very versatile, and it's portable, and somewhat inexpensive depending on how much storage space you need. DVD-Rs will usually cost about 4 to $0.05 cents per gigabyte of hosting. But there are several major downsides to this. It's very slow because you have to sit there and burn all of these things, two disks, one at a time, one disk at a time. You have to label all of these disks, keep them organized, keep them protected too because they can be fragile, they can be scratched, and then your backup is gone with just a simple scratch. And just managing all of these disks can be quite cumbersome, especially as you get into major large projects like video episodes where you might have 10 or 20 gigabytes for a video episode of original files and you can't put that on a single disc so then you have to start splitting it up and because each disc only holds so much they say 4.7 gigabytes it's more like 4.5 gigabytes but each disc can only hold so much so you'll end up with wasted space i would have to do this sort of juggling act in order to figure out what episodes could go on what discs and i couldn't just say this was episode one and two but this might be episode one three and seven because that's what fit on the disc the best and then the next disc is episode two five and ten it can really be a hassle and you will always end up with wasted space because you you have leftover unless you split up your files and that gets into a mess as well this is episode 2a 2b 2c so dvdrs inexpensive sure versatile yeah but uh, i don't really recommend them anymore and they have that same problem of being a local backup that if you had a fire at your house or a tornado or nuclear bomb your backups will be gone as well Second option you could consider, though, is, again, an external hard drive. These are extremely versatile, they're somewhat portable, and they're fairly inexpensive. Three and a half to four and a half cents per gigabyte. That's cheaper than a DVD-R. It used to be the other way around, that DVD-Rs were cheaper than external hard drives, but now external hard drives are cheaper. And you can then take advantage of all of the space you don't have to try and balance which episodes go in there it's very easy it's portable if you have some kind of emergency you could grab that hard drive and your computer and get out and you would save those things but it's still a local backup so if you have some kind of local catastrophe then you lose your backup but it is very easy to maintain hard drives though can sometimes fail especially if you're moving them around a whole lot and they're not solid state 
but it is very inexpensive, very versatile, and pretty easy to archive. Physical space, you will get so much more storage for the physical space of an external hard drive than with DVD-Rs. You look at a spindle of DVD-Rs will give you about 450 gigabytes of storage. But in a third of the space, you can have an external hard drive that gives you four terabytes or more of storage. So figure out there which one is better for you. I have a three terabyte external hard drive and it's a, uh, I don't know what brand it is actually, I think Western Digital. It works really well on my Mac. It's also USB 3, so it can be fast if I had USB 3 on my computer. You can look at Thunderbolt or Firewire connections that can be best for whatever platform you're using. Always think of something in the future though. So if you only have USB 2 now, don't just look at USB 2 hard drives. Look at something that's USB 3 and maybe that even supports Firewire or not Firewire, but Thunderbolt as well. So that if you ever move to a computer that has Thunderbolt, then you can take advantage of the speed. But even more of a powerful option, more versatile, I think, than either DVD-R or external backup or external hard drive is online backup. Some people will call this cloud backup. Many people will talk about Amazon S3. Amazon S3 is great. It's for uh, simple storage and it's fairly inexpensive but compare it to external hard drives. An external hard drive, three and a half to four and a half cents per gigabyte. Amazon S3 is 10 cents per gigabyte per month, but it is fast. It's versatile. S3 is more for if you want to store something online that other people across the internet can download. It's not that great for backups, like long-term backups. Instead, I recommend Amazon Glacier. Amazon Glacier is their, it's now about a year old service that is, well, it's really slow, but it's really inexpensive. Only a penny per gigabyte per month. The uploads are slow. The downloads are slow. You pay based on how much you store in a month and how much you may download. Now, it can take four hours to download a file, so definitely compress your files or your projects into a single file if you can Uh, one file one zip file per project but it's 12 cents per gigabyte to download after you've reached your free limit of one gigabyte in a month but only a penny per gigabyte per month and these would be for the things that you probably don't need to have regular quick access to but you don't want to delete them either get them off your hard drive but still have a copy of them somewhere. I use Amazon Glacier then for all of my long-term archives. Right now I have over 250 gigabytes stored in Amazon Glacier. That's many, many podcast episodes. And I'm only paying about $2.50 per month to store 250 gigabytes. Now over time that does mean you're going to pay more for that than an external hard drive. But what are the benefits? The benefits are I can upload to it very easily, especially if you get a free app like Simple Amazon Glacier Uploader. And I do recommend that you donate to the developer of that app. He's done a great job. It's the only cross-platform, free, easy Amazon Glacier Uploader that I know of. I've looked at many other ones out there and they charge or they're not that great or they only work on one platform or another. But Simple Amazon Glacier Uploader works on OS X and Windows and Linux I think it works great. And so you upload your data to Amazon Glacier. It takes a while to upload, but when it's there, it's stored and it's very inexpensive. So it can always be accessible. And if you have a catastrophe, you still have your files up there. I like Glacier for the long-term backups, not for my things that I might need again very soon. It's not very often that I have to restore a project from Glacier, but there have been a couple times and it's primarily because I realized, oh, I needed something and it was too far back into the past to still be on my local backups, but I could pull it from Amazon Glacier for 30, 50 cents or so and I get that file. So those are the backup methods that I recommend 
and tools for each of these backups, your recording backups, your revision backups, computer backup, WordPress website backup, and long-term archive backup. I'd love your thoughts on backups. What are the tools that you use and what do you think of some of these tools? If you are new to them or if you've been giving them a try or if you want to try them out, please comment on the show notes at theaudacitypodcast.com slash 143. And you can also get all of these links and many of them affiliate links that I mentioned for all of these tools there in the show notes. And make sure whatever you do, have a backup. Because if stuff fails, you will feel terrible if you didn't have a backup. Don't be that person who waits until after something bad goes wrong. And something bad goes wrong. <laughs> Don't be that person until who waits until something goes bad before you start getting serious about backup. Backup now. Today is the day of backup. Make sure you've got your stuff backed up. I've got a cool couple or few cool announcements for you. New Media Expo is coming up in January in Las Vegas, and I will be speaking at New Media Expo. Dave Jackson from School of Podcasting, Ray Ortega from Podcaster Studio and Podcasters Roundtable, and I will present a session on how to grow your podcast audience from hundreds to thousands. We would love to see you there. Please register as early as you can by going to theaudacitytopodcast.com slash NMX, that stands for New Media Expo, and register, and I really hope to see you there. If we haven't met in person especially, please find me, shake my hand, and tell me who you are and what podcasts you've been listening to and how I've helped you, because I, I love meeting the people that I've never interacted with before, but that are listening to my podcast. So if that's you, please come and introduce yourself to me. There's also an important change to the, to the iTunes affiliate program. I've previously recommended that you use LinkShare to generate affiliate links for your podcast in iTunes. That gives you the advantage of opening a podcast directly in iTunes, as well as the possibility that you can make a couple dollars here and there per month as people click on your subscribe link and then buy something else in iTunes. You get paid based on what else they buy within 72 hours of clicking your link. Apple has changed their affiliate programs, so they're no longer using LinkShare for this. They're now using a new affiliate program called PHG, and you need to switch all of your affiliate links over. Your old links will continue to work, but after October 1st, 2013, you won't get paid from those old affiliate links. So make sure that you switch all of your affiliate links over. That's going to be a pain, I know, for some of you. But switch all your affiliate links over to the new system. Apply to the new system. Make sure you tell them you're a podcaster, how you use the links, and that you were a member of LinkShare. And you could link them to your ID and all of that so that they know you are already trusted part of the affiliate program and move you over to the new one and get those links made. A little side note here, there are still problems with links opening directly in the podcast app on iOS. But if you use the new affiliate links from Apple, they do open properly in the podcast app. So that's even more reason to check that out and switch as soon as you can. Check that out in the show notes at theaudacitypodcast.com slash 143. Also, special thanks to Stitcher for featuring me in So You Think You Can Podcast, a list of top 10 how-to podcasts and notes, uh, certain episodes that they recommend for podcasters out there or people who want to start podcasting. And I've got that link in the show notes as well. Last announcement, podcast awards are coming up. The nominations open on October 1st, and that's pretty consistent every year, but this time October 1st, 2013 for the ninth annual podcast awards. Please nominate our podcasts in the awards. I'll have a video showing you how to do this later on, but here are the nominations that I ask that you put in for us. For People's Choice, put in Beyond the To-Do List at http colon slash slash beyond the to-do list.com for best produced once hyphen once upon a time podcast once podcast.com for business beyond the to-do list at beyond the to-do list.com for comedy the ramen noodle hyphen clean comedy podcast with the web address clean comedy podcast.com for entertainment once hyphen once upon a time podcast with the web address once podcast.com and for technology, this show, the Audacity to Podcast, 
with the audacity to podcast.com and that will be at podcast awards Dot com, or I will soon have a video showing you how to do this process and uh, more information about it over at the audacity to podcast.com slash podcast awards. I'd love to hear from you what you would like me to cover in a future episode of the audacity to podcast. Please email feedback at the audacity to podcast.com or call and leave a voicemail at 903-231-2221. And you can also go to the audacity to podcast.com on your computer or iOS device and send a voice message right from the website. Please also let me know in the comments about your either horror stories or salvation stories with backups and what kind of backup systems you use and prefer by commenting on the show notes at the audacity to podcast.com slash 143. One of the things I'd love to hear from you in a future episode of the audacity to podcast is what were your podcasting mistakes what do you wish you had done differently and how have you overcome some of those mistakes i'm looking forward to sharing some of my own mistakes and regrets and how i'm overcoming them or overcame them please follow me on twitter at the ramen noodle and let me know via email if you have any podcasting needs that i can help you with like helping you launch or improve your podcast just email feedback at the audacity podcast.com now that i've given you some of the guts and taught you some of the tools it's time for you to go podcast with passion organization and dialogue i'm daniel j lewis from the audacity podcast.com thank you for listening The Audacity to Podcast is a proud member of Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our podcast to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Like find out about the season finale of Under the Dome from our Under the Dome radio podcast or theorize over Once Upon a Time and Once Upon a Time in Wonderland TV shows. Learn how to be productive in your personal and professional life. Laugh with our clean comedy. Get some Christian worldview on movies and philosophy, science fiction, and more, and also discover some cool philosophy behind science fiction, and so much more at the Noodle Mix Network.